Good evening. Good evening. How are you? It's great to see you all today, tonight, for another exciting event in our Krasno event series. And I'm particularly pleased that we once again have got a very full house. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your loyalty. I'm Klaus Laris, as you may know. I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Please be so kind to fill in our mailing list, unless you are already on our mailing list. The sheets of papers are being circulated. And then please do not forget about our, uh, about our YouTube channel. As you know, we videotape all our events and they can be watched hopefully in eternity. So you can, uh, <laughs> you can watch them uh, over and over again, which undoubtedly you want to do. As you may also know, the defense budget of the United States is something like $716 billion. That is an increase of over 11% compared to last year. The country is also involved in many wars, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, of course, Iraq, sort of, and in many other conflicts all over the world. At the same time, the United States, or the leading proponents uh, of the United States government, have uh, on occasion expressed doubts about the validity of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. And at the same time, there's severe tension and strain between the United States and its loyal European allies, as well as other countries. So we can really and justifiably ask, has the United States lost its way? And that is, of course, the topic of our uh, evening today. And we have an expert, we need an expert to explain that all to us. That is our distinguished speaker, Colonel Lawrence um, um, Wilkerson. Wilkerson. <laughs> <laughs> that was a plan. <laughs> I'm thinking always of Larry. Larry was in my head instead of your full name. Um, Larry Wilkerson um, has had a very distinguished career. He is particularly well known as uh, uh, Chief of Staff to Colin Powell when Colin Powell was Secretary of State in the Bush administration. And he also was Deputy uh, Director of the Policy Planning Staff under Richard Haas in the State Department. Before that, he had a very long and distinguished career in the U.S. Uh, Army he, for 31 years. He, again, during that time, he was Chief of Staff to Colin Powell when Colin Powell was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he also was involved in the Naval War College. He ran the Marine Corps College in Quantico, and he did many other things during his long and distinguished career. So it's a great <coughs> pleasure to have you here tonight. We also have a very distinguished commentary tonight, that is Professor Emeritus Richard Cohn from uh, our own ranks at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Professor Cohn retired a few years ago, but he has remained very, very active regarding his research expertise on military-civilian relations, and he has many publications to his name. And I'm glad to say he occasionally joins us and supports the Krasno event series. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming, first of all, uh, Colonel Lawrence uh, Wilkinson here. <laughs> I've been called a lot worse. <laughs> uh, I can't resist commenting on one of the things uh, that the professor said. I was on the Hill last week, and I was with the professional staff from the Senate Finance Committee as they asked me for, and others who were there, some advice on what to do about the defense budget. And one of the first things I pointed out to them, and interestingly, they did not know that their own Congressional Budget Office had just produced this report, was that based on CBO estimates using very conservative inflation figures and very conservative annual rises in the defense budget, in both cases under 2%. By 2030, there will be no money for federal discretionary spending. The interest payments on our $22 trillion aggregate debt and the defense budget will consume the entire budget. Now, that's 
Partly because, as my Republican colleagues will tell you, especially, the entitlements portion is so high. But that tells you something about these stupid wars we're involved in. <laughs> 750 billion is the esp estimate for next physical. And if the recent commission, chaired by members of that illustrious group Eisenhower called the Military Industrial Complex, gets their way, and the increases in the defense budget even remotely look what they pr uh, promised, said was necessary or whatever, we'll be at a trillion dollars in just a few short years for the defense budget. So what we were doing in that meeting was telling these professional staffers and I thought it was a very rational discussion on both sides of the political aisle. Professional staffers tend to be that way. How they could cut $100 billion out of the defense budget every year for the next 10 years and not hurt a thing in terms of our national security. And that's my firm belief. You could probably even do more if you thought you had the political courage to go after. The very first thing you need to do is to, as I indicated by saying these stupid wars, is change the entire strategic envelope in which the defense budget is contained. And just to give you some indications, my students are working right now on something that's being called by the Pentagon cyber warfare. Uh, that covers a wide range of things that you can do to another state or another state can do to you or increasingly now, groups like ISIL, Al-Qaeda or others who have the capability can do to you. I would dare say there's at least a 50-50 chance that we are building things right now that we do not need. $14 billion aircraft carriers comes to mind immediately since I know that the reason we haven't put one in the Taiwan Strait recently is because the Chinese will sink it. And here's a good one for you. A Navy Admiral taking a chance in the proceedings, the Institute, Naval Institute Proceedings, the most prestigious magazine the military is associated with, recently said, let's just look at carriers for a moment from another perspective. I'm not anti-carrier, as previously people were anti-battleship in favor of the carrier. Let's just look at this for a moment. Let's say a carrier gets sunk, and let's say it's a usual kind of ship problem, that is to say, People are in the water, there's oil in the water, the water's burning. I mean, the kinds of things you've seen in battle scenes from Midway or whatever, they aren't that changed. There are not enough berths or space on the escorts to pick up the people. There are over 5,000 souls on that Nimitz class or Ford class carrier. There aren't enough escorts and spaces to pick up those people, and no one's thinking about that, said the Admiral, because we haven't been in a naval war in such a long time. We don't think about things like that. Recently, Zumwalt rolled off the ways up in Maine. I was there when she rolled out and went down the river. The Navy built that ship with all kinds of automation and requiring only a crew of less than 100. I think the figure now is about 72 to 75. Because its equivalent in the old Navy requires about 270 plus. Well, the Navy can't find enough people to man its ships, so Donald Trump can talk all day long about 50 more ships or whatever, but you got to find the people. The Army was 6,000 short last year and yet is paying $40,000 bribes in order to get the fourth and fifth quintile of America's population to serve. This is the most unfair years of war period we've had in our history. Read an article called The Casualty Gap, written by a couple of sociologists from the University of Minnesota, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It is an unfair situation. It's immoral. It's unethical. That's not what I'm here to talk about, really, although it is connected. Now, what I teach is the period following World War II, from about the National Security Act of 1947, July 1947, to the present, as much as we can get into the present, because obviously for the present there aren't a lot of archives, so it's, you know, you're doing research in magazines and newspapers. But we do try to look at, for example, the Trump administration. 
we look hard at the Eisenhower administration and the Nixon administration and so forth, where there is lots of archival material to do research. And what we have concluded from that study is that from the position of incredible power that the United States had in 1945 at the end of World War II, and it was augmented by the fact that most of the people who might have been competing with us were at our feet. Japan was still smoking. Britain was still smoking. Russia was stealing heavy industry from Germany and rushing it back to Russia so they could set back up again. France was pretty bad shape too. So most of our major competitors were down too, and we had roughly 50% of the world's GDP. In that last year of war, we made about 50,000 airplanes in a single year. We were the new Rome, no question about it. And we sat down in the 1947 National Security Act, not too differently than we sat down in Philadelphia many years hence. And we designed a new fabric, a new architecture, a new institu institutional structure for making national <laughs> security decisions. We call them fateful decisions in my seminars. They're seminars, I mean, they're decisions that send young men and young women to die for state purposes. And often something we forget to kill others for state purposes. Even by conservative estimates coming out of the Pentagon in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, we've probably killed somewhere around 200,000 or more people. It's a sobering thought when you think about it and you think about the nature of these stupid wars. So when we examine this, we examine it from the state-building point of view, first and foremost. That is to say, what is it that all those smart men, and they were almost all men, Ferdinand Eberstadt, Harry Truman, Dean Acheson, Paul Nitze, a whole host of others, what was it that they were trying to do creating the CIA, the National Security Council, and unifying the armed forces? Well, clearly they were trying to deal with the new power that we could accumulate. And the greatest contestant to that power wasn't the French or the Spanish or the British Empire. It was the new Soviet Union who exploded the atomic bomb a lot quicker than we thought in 49. I think the CIA had predicted 55. They weren't much better then than now. <laughs> and that was the recipe that they came up with, if you what the National Security Council, we determined over that period from 47 to the present, has done is consolidate all national security and ultimately because it follows almost like the night the day, foreign policy, in the White House. No cabinet government really anymore with regard to security and foreign policy. It's all in the White House. State Department stamps visas. State Department mans embassies, consulates, and other things around the world, but the decision making is in the White House, all centralized. First thing we figured out. Second thing we figured out is that the 16, now 17 intelligence entities that were kind of grown up around the CIA, some of it had been there before, of course, military in particular suddenly started being more or less obeisant to the lead dude, in this case the CIA, charged to give strategic intelligence, not operational, not tactical, but strategic intelligence <coughs> to this decision-making process centered in the National Security Council. I sometimes thrill my journalist friends by saying, can you tell me who's on the National Security Council? I've not found one yet who could tell me. Not one. Yesterday, I sent an email to, to a William and Mary professor who invited my students to come with her and visit the NSC. <laughs> I said, Professor, you're going to visit the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of Energy? That's who you're going to visit? No, you're going to visit some members of the NSC staff in the old Executive Office building, Eisenhower building, or somewhere else. Uh, she came back and said, well, you're being so, uh, you're just being so pedantic. <laughs> okay, I'm just making a point with you that nobody knows what the National Security Council is, and they love that. They love that. They are the people who make the decisions. 
Now, there are aberrations, of course. No two presidencies are alike, and therefore no two national security councils are alike. The other mistake the journalists make all the time is they put the national security advisor, a very powerful man, not subject to the advice and consent of the Senate, not elected, yet one of the most powerful men in America in terms of foreign and security policy, or women. They put him on the NSC. He's not on the NSC. He's a staff officer. He's a staff officer. He's extremely powerful. And we usually wind up at the end of a seminar or two asking why. Why did the American people let this happen? That you put this national security advisor there, who when Eisenhower came in was really kind of Ike's idea of a chief of staff. He needed somebody to run the staff itself. And now it's evolved into Henry Kissinger. Yeah. Um, now it's evolved into people who are really significant wielders of power. And if you look at the man that I know best in the White House right now, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, third one, by the way, for Donald Trump, uh, you understand why I continue to harp on that. <laughs> this is not a man I would want that close to real significant power, particularly with regard to faithful decision making. So how did we get here? How did we get here slowly, over time, deliberately, and without the American people paying any attention? We are now at a position where, when you go over to the House and the Senate, as I have been doing now for six months, both houses, trying to get them to use a law they passed, which is based on the Constitution, the so-called War Powers Act, to stop the United States from participating in this brutal, heinous war against the enemy by the Saudis and the UAE, I have had people look at me and say, "That's a, we can't do that. That would have, This is a senator. That would abridge the executive's right to do what he needs to do to maintain this safety of this country. <coughs> One senator actually stood up in a hearing called by Bob Corbin, then chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and addressed himself to the speaker and said, essentially, I think the president ought to have the right to determine whether or not nuclear weapons are going to be used without consulting this body. He's got military advisors and other advisors who are adequate. Now, there was no suggestion on Senator Reich of Idaho's part that the president would deliberate this in any way or that, you know, it was a sense of urgency that he couldn't come to the Congress. It was just... Pro forma. It was matter of fact. It was, you know, this is the way the world's evolved. It even had the gall to say that that particular part of the Constitution was an anachronism. I'm over there trying to get them to get us out of that war by exercising their power. And I'm even giving them that the special forces there fighting Al Qaeda in, the Yemen, in, in, in Yemen, who are very dangerous people, believe me. Um, we're giving them a pass. No, leave the special forces there. They're fighting our enemy in Yemen. But get out of that war with the Saudis. And, and then the kicker with them, because I'm going as a military professional, not as a professor. The kicker is the Saudis are losing. And they're losing badly. And so what do they do? As they lose even more badly, they drop more bombs and kill more people. And we provide them the intelligence to do that. This is the ultimate stupid war. And what have they done on top of that? <clears throat> They've invited a smart leadership in Tehran to take advantage of their stupidity, to move into Yemen, and to begin at a very little cost to them, support the Houthi rebels who are fighting against the Saudis and the UAE. Not content with that, the brilliant strategic leader of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, also creates a mess on his other flank with Qatar. Such a big mess that he invites his number one ideological enemy in the world, Turkey. Erdogan comes from the Muslim Brotherhood. That is anathema to the Wahhabist in Saudi Arabia. So he invites him in to Qatar to protect Qatar against him and virtually destroys the Gulf Cooperation Council, our answer, our NATO, if you will, for the Persian Gulf region. 
Why is all this happening? Well, it's all happening because, in part at least, what I just told you, the crafting of this national security state, as Michael Hogan has so well called it in his book, Cross of Iron, has come to fruition to the point where the White House is all important, omnipotent, and the only decision maker. And if the White House can do that, can be that and do that, then you're going to just have more war and more war and more war. Why did I think then that we were going to get a change with the current president? Because I listened to him during his campaign. And I thought that he understood what was happening intuitively, if not intellectually, and that his comments about the stupid war here, the stupid war there, and so forth, would bring him to shut some of this down. Well, you have two choices on that one. And I'm not talking about this phenomena that people call the deep state, or bureaucracy, or the meritocracy, or whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about what happens in Washington, which is mostly based on incompetence rather than it is conspiracy. What happens when that occurs is the rest of the lobby power, the money power, the oligarchs, the plutocrats, call them what you want, wades in and says, okay, i got a real turkey here. I can make this happen the way I want it to happen. There's another wrinkle to this. And this is a wrinkle that I just learned about recently from a professor at Duke. You may have read her book, Democracy in Chains. And it's another state-building effort. That's what it really is. We talked about it over in the Carolina Inn today. It's the first time we'd ever met. I'd read her book and everything. And I said, you know, we've got two state building efforts going on here. One's come to fruition with the national security state, which finds its raison d'etre in waging war. You think we've only seen 18 years? <laughs> Unless we, the American people, do something, we're going to see a lot more. That state has come to fruition and is now doing its art upon the world, if you will. But we got another state, too, and she describes it well in Democracy and Change, and it's a state funded now and fueled now, both intellectually and dollar-wise, by Charles and David Koch and the Koch Institute. And this state is trying to build a predatory capitalist utopia, if you will, where only the Charles and David Cokes and people like them will be able to survive, prosper, and be free, while the rest of us beaver away in the trenches as their sheep. I mean, that's putting uh, too fine a point on it, maybe, but it's not too fine. Read that book. <laughs> that book literally scared the bejesus out of me when I read it. I was in New York City with an entrepreneur financial consultant, managed Bill Gates' money for a long time, worth about a half a billion dollars himself, and he handed me the book, and he said, Larry, go home and read this, because you're going to be shocked when you read this. And I did. And it is stunning that we have this effort to, let's put it this way, three states, right? It's all theoretical, but it makes sense. Got the welfare state that FDR started and put really into big motion, and its accoutrements are things like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and so forth. And regulation, and labor. You got that state, dying. Dying. Is there a labor movement in America that means anything at all anymore? It's dying. And you got in its place the predatory capitalist state that's been building itself for a long time. What does that mean? It means that you have people in the national security state like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Grumman, and so forth who are in the other state too. So I'm waiting to see how this internecine warfare plays out in Washington because most of the people who are supposed to be ruling this republic are utterly oblivious to this. They're as oblivious to this as they are to the war in Yemen, which one senator said to me is a niche issue and I'm not really concerned about it. A niche issue. The greatest humanitarian disaster since World War II. Terrible situation over there. And we're helping it be terrible and brutal. And it's a niche issue. So there's no help going to come from the Congress that I've been dealing with in this regard 
I'm hopeful that some of the new people up there, some of whom I've met and been very impressed by, are going to change this somewhat. But these two states are waging it out with each other right now, with spies in each other's camps. You've got the people who want to dismantle everything that had anything to do with FDR and what they call pejoratively the welfare state and throw out socialism and communism and everything else to get their, their base rallied around it. And the national security state, whose whole purpose is waging war, and making millions, billions, I should say, even trillions, and the whole mess that that has created in Washington with a bunch of people trying to get together and do the kinds of things that are necessary to do so you and your grandchildren, my grandchildren, have a decent life in the future. This is extraordinary if you're watching it from my point of view. I have been in the legislative branch of government now, off and on, for almost a decade working on everything from the nuclear agreement with Iran to rapprochement with Cuba for the, for the Obama administration to now the war in Yemen. And it's astonishing to me how ignorant, and I don't mean that in a majority sense, I mean they just don't know, these people are with regard to these crucial things that are happening to our country. Let alone understanding that the normal historical weight of empire is beginning to weigh heavily. What did we start talking about? The cost of empire. The cost of this far-flung empire. Between all the other countries in the world that have the wherewithal and the desire and intent to have bases, they have about 77. We have 800. It costs us about 75 to 100 billion dollars a year, if we're honest about it, just to maintain those bases. We need those bases, many of them, like we need a hole in the head. It is extraordinary what the complex, what the warfare state, the national security state, has been able to steal from you in order to propagate and to prosper across the world. If you look at the figures on clear profit over the last 17 years for Raytheon, Boeing, Halliburton, Lockheed Martin, and so forth, it will stagger you. I told someone the other day when I came into the State Department, I remember the shares of Lockheed were about $26 a, a, a piece. I had to divest myself of them. I did so willingly. I, didn't even, I really didn't have to because I had so few. <laughs> Last time I looked, when we were at the peak of the Iraq-Afghan combo war, they were about $179. When war is that just profitable, sheer profit, you're going to have more of it. But it's worse than that. They actually lobby your Congress now to the extent that they actually have a weight. One of my Air Force friends said, you don't mean that they went in and lobbied Dick Cheney and said, get us a war and we'll make some money. No, it doesn't work that way. It's much more subtle. It's much more sophisticated. It's the pressure. It's the weight. It's the money. So this state is prospering, but it is bringing us down in the imperial sense. I ask my students sometimes, where do you know of an empire that survived? Give me the Third Reich, give me the Abyssinian, give me the Mongol hordes, give me Tamerlane, give me anybody you want. They didn't survive. Where is it written in granite that the American empire is forever? It isn't. Nowhere I can find anyway. And it isn't forever. So that warfare state is bleeding the empire at a rate and a price right now that one wonders that coincidental with that time when there's no federal discretionary spending, we aren't going to really take it. I mean take it badly. One senator said to me, you haven't heard about modern monetary theory. <coughs> What's that mean? Well, he then said what Dick Cheney said when his own budget director, George Bush's budget director, asked him if he wanted to increase the deficit by so much, as we were discussing the war in Iran, or in Iraq. Deficits don't matter. Ronald Reagan proved that, said Dick Cheney. Well, this new modern monetary theory says deficits don't matter. As long as you have a very powerful military, and you are the last safe haven for investment, <coughs> then Saudi money, Chinese money, whatever, it has no other place to go. It's still going to come here. They're still going to buy our treasuries. 
notes and so forth. It's fine if we're going to be able to do whatever we want to do in the world. And the dollar gives us that power. We can print money until the cows come home. This is a new theory in Washington. And I understand there's a difference between running your family and the budget for your family and a nation and the budget for your nation. I mean, I'm not that stupid. I'm not an economic expert or a finance expert, a finance expert, but I'm familiar with some of the arguments of people like Alexander Hamilton and others. But I just don't, that doesn't fit well with me, that we can run up deficits to the point that they just can keep going forever and they don't matter. So we are at the point of the imperial overstretch that, in my mind, at any moment could bring this empire down. And it isn't going to be the kind of thing that it was for Britain. We had replaced Britain in 1890, really, if you look at the figures. And we certainly had replaced them post-World War I. And maybe it took Suez in 56 to really show them that we'd replaced them, but we'd replaced them. But that was a gradual movement from the imperial sun never set on the British Empire down to Jerry I mean, Greenstock said to me the other day, we're a middling power now. I said, Jerry, you're more than a middling power. He said, no, we're a middling power now. Well, we are 300 million plus people stretching from sea to sea, benign border to benign border, rivers and other things that no other country in the world really has at the advantage we do. And yet I still tell you, we can go down. Physically, morally, ethically, we can go down. One of the fastest ways to go down would be dismemberment. Go back and read about the period from 1850 to 1860. And then read about the period from 1866 to about 1875. And tell me that there isn't the potential for dismemberment of this empire. That is to say, of this union. So there are all kinds of ways we could go out. But I'm looking at it from my point of view that it isn't going to be slow. This isn't going to be deliberate. There's going to be no one developing a glide slope that would take us down to uh, Paris into Paris <coughs> rather than Primus into Paris. We're going to collapse almost overnight. One senator asked me a question about the military the other day. He said, if we impeach the president, where will the military go when he calls his guns to the street? Wow. I said, that would be a constitutional crisis of the first order. <laughs> he said, I'm asking you. I said, well, the rank and file mostly voted for President Trump. The officer corps split, you know, probably half and half, maybe not quite that easy or that even. I don't know where they would go, but I don't think they would shoot Americans. Thank you. I've got to go vote. Out the door. Ah, 21 years in the Senate, this guy had. Um, there are people who are thinking about the worst possible scenario developing. They're not thinking very hard about it and very long about it because they go out the door and go vote or go do whatever it is they have to do, which is normally picking up the phone and calling for more money. There are a few people in Washington who understand, at least at part, the danger that we're in, but not many. I sensed amongst the 60 new Congress members that I met the other day at a party where at most I had a 10, 15 seconds with each of them. Some of them I stopped and talked to at length because I sensed that they were in the right place. I sensed a, a, an overall desire to change things. But I didn't sense a real deep, profound grasp of how bad the situation really is and what it would take to change it. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see how they get their act together and, and how that changes the Congress if it does. We've seen these kind of massive infusions of young blood or different blood before, and it hasn't made much difference because the powers that are arrayed against them institutionally and statewide are enormously powerful and almost impregnable <coughs> to the legislative branch anymore. In many respects, if you spend as much time over there as I do, you have to come away saying, there is only one branch of government anymore. That even goes for the judiciary now. The judiciary used to stay away from national security issues, for example. Stay away from them. That was political. That was the Congress and the President, the President and the Congress. Not anymore. Increasingly, they're creeping up 
on making decisions about adjudicating national security issues. Much of it in secret, <coughs> which is how much of your government operates today. And on top of that, with 840,000 people who have top secret code word clearances, most of them are contractors. Can you conceive of that many people walking around Washington, D.C. and elsewhere who know secrets that if Vladimir Putin had them, he would benefit greatly? You mean by if? This is unbelievable that we've done this, that we've let this happen to ourselves. We are an empire gone wild and fallen from grace, in my view. We never were perfect. Most of our leaders who were worth anything would admit in a heartbeat that we weren't perfect. We started with slavery. We started with ethnic cleansing from uh, Mississippi, uh, why I say there, from the eastern seaboard to the western seaboard. We started with manifest destiny that turned into an imperialism in the Philippines and Cuba and elsewhere. I mean, we are not innocent babes, that's for sure. But we always maintain a modicum of belief in the American dream in a reasonably equitable society, in taking care of the individual as well as the collective, in doing things that basically would stand the light of day most of the time, I'm telling you, it's changed. And it's changed mostly because of this concentration of power in the White House and in the executive branch, and simultaneously almost, this attempt by oligarchs, called them plutocrats, oligarchs, take your Aristotle or your Plato, who were right there with them, fighting. I'll finish with this anecdote. A couple of years ago, when I was speaking out quite frequently on public television and elsewhere about these stupid wars, I was visited in a restaurant in Washington, D.C. by a representative, he vouchsafed to me that he was a vice president, of the Koch Institute. He said to me, we want your message to be more potent, more powerful, more profound, more widespread. We are going to fund you. You tell us what you need, where you want to go, and we'll make it happen. And stupid me, I looked back at him and I said, why are you so anti-war? Is it because you see all the money going out of the treasury from these wars that you want to steal? I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> and yet, and yet, in the last six months, the most powerful bipartisan group of people in Washington that I'm associated with now, because I work with the devil to stop the war in Yemen, are together for that purpose, to stop the warfare state. It includes Breitbart. It includes the Ron Paul Institute. It includes some of the people I would have claimed five years ago I'd never sit down with. All allied together, money flowing to stop the war in Yemen. And generally stop the warfare state. I don't care what their reasons are. But I do recognize as an academic and as a person immersed in it that these are two battling states right now. The one wants to be J. Pierpoint Morgan United States forever in the day and screw you. And the other wants to kill everybody in the world that doesn't agree with them and maybe some others. And their battle is, is titanic right now. And the legislative branch, the courts, are caught in the middle of it and have no idea what to do. Thank you. Richard, Professor Richard Cohn will now uh, respond to what we have just heard, and then we have a panel discussion on stage, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from you, the audience. Professor Cohn, sure. sir. Well, thank you all, and thank you for being here, and it's an honor and a pleasure to, to uh, add to uh, what Colonel Wilkerson has said. I don't disagree with what he has said. He has isolated one of the great challenges, I, I think, in the United States today and into the future. He's also identified, I think, uh, the core problem with it. 
But what uh, that is, the structures that we created uh, to wage the Cold War in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, but I want to put a larger context on this uh, to try to understand what uh, must be done. As Lenin said, what, what is it that must be done when he took power or was taking power? The problem is not stupid wars. They're not uh, consuming uh, uh, the amount of money that perpetuates the problem we have. The problem is the national security policy and strategy we have been pursuing for the last 30 years, um, uh, with the end of the Cold War, we have continued it. Uh, the aircraft carriers are no different uh, except in capability from what we developed in the 1920s. We have essentially a military establishment funded far beyond anyone's dream uh, that the people who fought World War II would recognize and was developed in the 1920s uh, and 30s. Uh, four armed services, actually five. We want a sixth and a seventh now, uh, but that's uh, what it is. Uh, it's not the stupid wars. These wars, which began uh, really with the Korean War in the wake of World War II, um, are essentially indeterminate, endless wars. Wars that go on because they can come to no conclusion, the first two, Korea and Vietnam, were actually campaigns of the Cold War. When the Cold War ended in 1989, 1990, 91, we began to wage the same kinds of wars, but they were more indeterminate uh, and more indecisive, uh, and they simply uh, have gone on uh, forever uh, because we don't know how to uh, get ourselves uh, out of them. The problem, as I see it, is a historical one, and it's a very simple one. After every major war in the United States history, we have stepped back and reconsidered our role in the world, uh, our foreign policy, and the way in which we will safeguard uh, this country. In 1783, between then and the War of 1812, in 1865 and 1866, in 1919, and again in the late 1940s. We did not do that in the early 1990s. The Cold War was over. It was a war. Believe me, it was a war. If you look at the forces, you look at the way it was waged uh, and the way it uh, was carried out. Uh, one uh, country uh, emerged or, or alliance emerged intact and the other uh, collapsed. The failure to reconsider our role in the world and our military establishment, our national security policy, our national strategy, was the product, I think, of several factors. Colonel Wilkerson identified one. The power that was created by the national security state in the 1940s and 1950s. We put the military and military affairs uh, at the center uh, of the power uh, of the Pentagon. Uh, it was no conspiracy. It was, in fact, functional. The key to outlasting the Soviet Union and its empire and its allies was to contain it and to deter it and to outlast it without having a nuclear war which would have devastated the world. And it was a great success. But when the Soviet Union disappeared, did we really need to keep that strategy and policy and that force structure necessary to wage war everywhere around the world in order to prevent the expansion of communism, communism evaporated. You can't tell me that China is a communist country. It has its appearances, but it's not. There are communism really failed uh, and died. But that national security state <coughs> embedded itself in American culture and government because of the combination of American people liking being the number one power in the world because of defense policies and defense uh, uh, industries, because of the iron triangle of those industries, the military, Congress, the unions, the areas. You know, you and all, and I live in a military state. North Carolina is as close to it as we have, if you look at the economy 
and, and the installations, maybe Texas, maybe parts of California. That existed. And then there was uh, the uh, outgrowth, the aftermath of the Vietnam War, the guilt that Americans felt uh, by the way we had treated our armed forces uh, after, during and after the Vietnam War, uh, the desire in the Gulf War, if you'll remember, to support the troops even if you don't support the war, and the incredible rise in public prestige and legitimacy of the armed forces, if you look at the polling uh, in the late 80s and 1990s uh, and ever uh, since. And so a reluctance, a fear, on the part of the leadership of the American Congress, the executive branch, the people running uh, for office, particularly the presidency, to question whether we should or should not continue these structures from the Cold War. They had enormous public support. And that budget has grown and grown and grown. So what I would say to you, uh, I think it was Einstein who said when you, or maybe it was Thomas Edison, when you have a problem, uh, spend 90% of your time explaining why we ha what the problem is and why we have it, and 10% of your time as to how to fix it. So let me take my last 10% and tell you uh, how we need to fix it. We need to reconsider this structure and our policies. We need a national debate on the role of the United States in the world uh, and the kinds of institutions that will support it. We need to be absolutely skeptical, as Colonel Wilkinson is, uh, uh, about uh, the uh, uh, offerings, the ideas uh, of those who are invested in and part of the national security state. From the political leadership, from the Congress people wanting to get elected and reelected, the businesses, and above all, the armed forces. You cannot reform the American military. For the history, in my judgment, has demonstrated in the last probably 130, 150 years, you can't do it without the cooperation of the military itself. Despite Mr. Trump, we still believe in this country in expertise. And if you think you can change the armed forces, either structurally uh, or, or effectively, or from a budget standpoint, or from a weapons standpoint, uh, without the cooperation of the military leadership, I think you're kidding yourself. So the first step that has to be is we have to take a solid, if we believe in civilian control of the military, we need civilians in the Defense Department and elsewhere in the Congress uh, and in the executive branch to reconsider how we grow our military leadership, what they know, what they understand, what their perspective is, uh, and that has to be done. Actually, uh, Secretary of Defense Carter started it with his views uh, of uh, changing uh, the military officer uh, system. So if we grow and if we talk and if we discuss it, these transition periods in American military history often take uh, 20 or 30 or more years. They did after the Revolutionary War. They haven't in the, in the three major wars since then. But we are 30 years now, 30 years, 2019, from the end of the Cold War. And it's time we started to rethink uh, these structures and how they behave uh, and how they're developed and how they're led. And it's the structures. It's the $750 billion. It's not the 20 30 $40 billion that go into one of these, what, what the colonel calls stupid wars, and I would call just you know uh, endless, indecisive uh, wars that we get ourselves pinioned into uh, because we are operating with a Cold War mindset, uh, uh, which is understandable. We couldn't with just withdraw from the world in the 1990s and allow those areas in which we had been the bulwark for our values uh, to just collapse into a chaos or allow uh, other nations uh, to go on an imperial or um, uh, aggressive stance. But the time is long since. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to happen unless you are engaged, unless the American people demand it, unless they insist upon having a discussion, and unless they question, as the Colonel has, uh, what we are, how we behave, what our institutions are, and what our thinking is. We need to change the parameters, and we need to educate our leadership from the ground up. Thank you.
both speakers encouraged us to rethink America's role in the world. And I think that's a you know, very justified call to action. So let me ask both of you, you know, is perhaps President Trump right after all when he questions why America has an alliance? Do we need Article 5? Do we need NATO? After all, NATO is a Cold War institution. The Cold War, as Professor Cole said, has ended 30 years ago almost. Uh, why not get rid of it and recognize that the Europeans have become economic rivals? And that's it. Colonel Wilkerson, what do you think about that devil's uh, advocate speech? <laughs> well, I've been following Trump's campaign and, and now his presidency, which seem to blend abnormally, um, as closely probably as I could under the circumstances of every other thing. And I, there, are things, there are things that he said that have resonated with me. As a Burkean conservative, as a Republican, uh, there aren't many of us left. Um, the things that he said about getting out of the stupid wars I, really resonated with me, as they did with a lot of people across the country. And one of the things that these sociologists and then political scientists whom they called in corroborated was one, that this is the most unbalanced period America's ever experienced in terms of who's fighting and dying. And two, that it had political impact. They went out, went out and did some really exquisite polling and home visits and so forth and discovered that it, controlling for other factors, that it really did have an impact on people who had lost a member or had a member badly wounded voting for Donald Trump because of some of the things that he'd said during the campaign. So, um, it, I'm not against everything that President Trump stands for, and whether it's intuitively or intellectually, he has said some things that me as a colonel was saying well before he said them. And the NATO alliance is one of them. When we started the Partnership for Peace in 91, 92, as I recall, and turned it over to General Shalakis Vili when he became the chairman when Powell left in 93, the full expectation of the president, the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, the chairman, and others was that uh, we were doing that minimum thing to kind of pave the way, if you will, for EU membership, not for ultimate NATO membership. And that what we were doing was creating a road by which Russia could sail into the NATO alliance. First as an observer, and then later, as everyone grew comfortable with it, and so forth, if they did, um, maybe as a member of both the political and the military alliance. Uh, that got reversed really fast. And all of a sudden, NATO was expanding all over the place. Um, I'm not in favor of the NATO alliance as it is right now. It's sticking fingers in Putin's face every day. My president went to Georgia and announced publicly that Georgia would in the future be a member of NATO. If I'd been Putin, I'd have invaded too. <laughs> or at least a little part of it he did. Um, and I'd be doing what Putin is doing elsewhere if, if I were trying to secure my near abroad, my sphere of influence, whatever you want to call it. But that doesn't mean you want to, you want to disband the NATO. No, because we put it where it is. And we've got some very important relationship there. Not the relationships, not the least of which are Germany, France, and Britain. Uh, so I don't know where we would go now, but Trump is experimenting with it. However inexpertly and perfectly, he's experimenting with it. Thank you. Professor Cook. Well, I would say, I would say that Trump is right to question it, but, but he offers no alternative. In, in fact, he behaves like not only the empty suit that I think he is, but the empty head uh, that he is. He has not started a discussion uh, of what would come in its wake. And in fact, uh, NATO is the one alliance that I think we, we need to maintain because of uh, Russia's defensiveness, because of uh, our poking the bear in the eye, uh, because of the weakness of Russia uh, economically and, and socially and politically. And so it could cause no end of trouble in Europe, which we have to maintain as the most stable uh, of our friendships, uh, not only for uh, European security, but for uh, managing uh, the chaos that lies beneath the surface, sometimes above, uh, in the Middle East and in Northern uh, Africa. 
But I think he's done really stupid things. The partnership, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was, was a wonderful uh, idea. I mean, we have tremendous uh, economic, um, uh, social, uh, political, and cultural power around the world, and it needs to be used. Uh, we don't need to use our military power. We used it and had to in Afghanistan, but we should have been out of there within a very few years, two or three or four years, and not try to recreate uh, a liberal democracy uh, in, in Central Asia. Uh, the same goes uh, for Iraq. Uh, it, it's really the, 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 stupidity, the stupid, stupidity uh, uh, and the, um, I guess it would say, arrogance and self-confidence in the United States that leads us badly in this respect. But I, don't, uh, I, I do think we need to uh, take an inventory, essentially, of our relationships with areas and specific countries, uh, maintain as much leadership uh, and as much influence as we can uh, without uh, undermining uh, local structures, local uh, political structures, uh, and particularly local cultures. You know, when you try to spread uh, capitalism uh, and democracy around the world, that is a threat to large uh, numbers of countries and cultures, and, and we have been not only clumsy, uh, but I think uh, uh, aggressive and hostile in doing it. My favorite, and I'll close with that, my favorite the bumper sticker of the Iraq war was, be nice to Americans or they'll bring democracy to your country too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me, but, yeah, we, let me just add one yeah. thing. Um, I'm, as, because of the Europeans and the transatlantic link is pretty solid, no matter what you do, especially with Germany, France, and Britain, I'm, and this may be my bias because I, unlike most soldiers, I served most of my time in the Pacific. I'm really worried about Japan and Korea right now. I'm really worried about them. Um, I see that as probably a more dangerous area right now, even with Putin poised to do some of the things he's doing. Uh, it's, it's just unbelievable what we've done over there. And if this second summit doesn't come off, um, Trump has essentially said to Kim Jong-un, you can have your nuclear weapons. That's, that's what he said last week. You can have your, there's no timeline associated with this. Well, that's what Kim was after. And the second thing he's after is the dismemberment of the U.S. South Korean alliance. Um, and he's well on the road for that. So, what's going to happen in Vietnam, I think, is very serious. The man watching this is Prime Minister Abe, who's trying to almost overstep himself to make himself uh, a friend of Trump's and make Japan a friend. But he's worried. He's so worried that he's already started the movement to nuclearize Japan in terms of weapons. Now, it was already there, it's always been latent, but Japan could be a full up nuclear power in a very short time, probably less than 18 months. So, th this is a scary moment in Northeast Asia for all my friends in Australia, New, New Zealand, Indonesia, and elsewhere. And you, some you haven't been watching probably because your press is not watching it. We just had 40 people killed and a whole bunch wounded in Kashmir. And we're hearing things from Delhi and Islamabad like we heard in 2002. We're hearing talk of exchange of nuclear weapons. And I can tell you right now, we went to both cities and we were absolutely appalled at the immaturity of their thinking about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. And we tried to change that. We, we did, I thought, a pretty good job of teaching both countries um, that they need to think about things like escalation and deterrence theory and the things that we had developed during the Cold War along with the Soviets. We also gave them permissive action links for their weapons. They didn't even have those. This is something that keeps you from being able to pick the weapon up and shoot it if you're a colonel in the ISI or the Pakistani military. Um, this is very dangerous. And how much have you seen about that in the American media? Thank you. Thank you. But, but, but you wouldn't. You, you don't think we need to go to war in defense nope. of South Korea or Japan. Nope. Japan is remilitarizing yep. and, and uh, doing everything except changing the words in its constitution. We, we need to make sure, sure we become a great power. Yeah, we need we need to make sure that we are there helping. But you're not worried about the Japanese American alliance. You're worried about Japan becoming a nuclear power. Japan, Japan and China still are at loggerheads with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and to a certain extent, Korea and Japan are surprising everyone because we haven't been there. I've been there. Richard Haas and I spent a lot of time in Seoul and Tokyo and Beijing. And we spent that time there to talk to our counterparts in each of the governments 
and to keep them from each other's throats in some cases. We were the good offices country. We were the mediator. We were the balancer, if you will. No one's doing that now. The Koreans and the Japanese are free to hurl epithets at each other, maybe bombs. <laughs> the U.S. doesn't seem to care. Well, the United States has really withdrawn its leadership in so many ways in so many places uh, under this administration. Uh, in part because there are no people in these, in these higher offices. 60 uh, ambassadors not filled yet. Right. Including South Korea, I believe. Uh, finally put Harry Harris there. Yeah, they, that's finally. Right. Diverted him from Australia. Right. <laughs> are you worried about China as well? About China? I think, I think China is... Uh, country with whom we should be more dealing and more friendly and more helping and all the things that go along with uh, smart diplomacy, smart economic and financial policy while at the same time we're hedging our bets. But negotiations are taking place at this very moment. Yes. I, I read a piece yesterday, I said I'm no economist, I'm no financial expert or anything, but this piece and the TED talk that went along with it is all about how we are getting ready to embark, and I may have indeed already embarked on a trade war um, scenario in this world that none of us is going to benefit from. None of us. We, we don't need that anywhere. What we need is to somehow leverage or persuade or bluff or intimidate the Chinese into stop uh, uh, improving their economy and their economic situation in the world uh, by stealing technology uh, from the United States, yeah, that's, which that's they have been problems. doing uh, to, the, to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And that is one good thing I think the uh, NSC under the Trump administration has been pushing. Yes. I, I'll give you a, just an anecdote. We were at the National De Defense University a couple years ago. Leon Firth, me, the director of the CIA, the DNI, a whole bunch of people uh, really trying to craft a better way to make decisions. Uh, that's the best way to put it. Um, and one of the things we saw there was what was happening with regard to China, the United States, Japan, other countries too, but um, nobody listening to the other side to the tune of real benefit for both. There were, there were, there were even suggestions, Rich, Richard Hotz, for example, talked about this from time to time about he didn't use the word uh, condominium, but he talked about integration. That was his favorite term. He couldn't seem to make integration as sexy as containment. <laughs> he wanted to substitute integration for containment, the new strategy, you know, one word strategy. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that. But back to this anecdote. We had sitting at the table with us one particular hour of this series of sessions, the vice president for government relations from General Electric. And when Leon leaned over and sort of in a microphone voice in front of the whole group, really, uh, sort of challenged him about a particular technology that had then been seen in China and was GE, and challenged him that GE had actually allowed that to happen, he looked at Leon and he said, our fiduciary responsibility is our first mission. Essentially saying, hey, if we can make money selling this technology to China, we will. Leon and I immediately realized that transnational corporations are not patriotic. <laughs> Thank you. Let me ask you, before we open it to questions from the audience, uh, let me ask you about the wars in Afghanistan and Syria. Recently, uh, President Trump announced he would withdraw from Syria. That was highly controversial. The Defense Secretary Mattis, he even resigned over it. And so it has been debated quite hotly. What do you think? Should one leave uh, from Syria? Should one leave from Afghanistan as soon as possible? Or is that really, under the current uh, circumstances, quite impossible? Well, I would say that the, uh, the, the uh, Syrian war and the allow allowing it to metastasize has been probably the chief uh, impetus to the unhinging of European <coughs> politics over immigration to include Brexit and other things. So we would leave uh, Syria at our peril and the peril uh, to Western uh, democracies. I think what we have to do is to stay and uh, uh, help, uh, in particular, uh, our 
friends the Kurds who are fighting uh, to uh, uh, have uh, some influence in what emerges and try to lead all of the uh, participants in that uh, civil war uh, into some kind of non-war settlement. In Afghanistan, it seems to me we have to uh, support the uh, central government that we have created over there and we need, we'll probably need to stay there with small numbers of troops uh, for a generation more to prevent it from being uh, a safe haven for uh, international terrorism that wants to attack the United States. But a peace treaty is being negotiated. A peace, right a peace treaty would be somewhat similar in my judgment to the 1973 Paris Accords that gave South Vietnam to North Vietnam. And I do not believe that we can uh, trust the Taliban. Uh, it, 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 if you look at what they believe in, what they say, uh, that, that they'll be part of the government and so forth, and it won't be terrorism. Uh, they're part of an international jihad that we have to, if not contain, at least combat for our own protection. So I would minimize our footprint in both of those countries and be very clear about why we're there and what we are going to do there to safeguard ourselves. So we need the 716 billion defense budget. If you, if you think you need 760 billion dollars to deal with uh, uh, Afghanistan and Syria, uh, I think you have to go into a different business. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wilkinson, what do you think about Afghanistan and Syria? Should we leave, should we stay? We need to talk about how we would take 100 billion a year because it wouldn't hurt a thing. It'd help us a lot. That money could do things in, in different places, better things. Um, I'm going to differ here. First of all, it's canard that we're leaving the Middle East. Okay? The largest naval fleet headquarters in the world is in Bahrain. The largest U.S. Air Force base in the world is in Qatar. The second largest is in Saudi Arabia, along with 11 others. The largest logistic and reception facility in the world is in Kuwait. We exercise with Egypt. We have troops in Egypt. We have troops in Oman. We are still in Iraq. It is a canard that we're leaving the Middle East. Now, let me hasten to say that when I was a colonel planning the strategy from U.S. Pacific Command for the Middle East, we had one rule that was like the Princess Bride, never a lamb war in Asia, you know? Our rule was no U.S. troops on the ground in that volatile region. And we stuck to that for a long time. It was carrier battle groups in the North Indian Ocean. It was marine amphibious ready groups and so forth. If we needed to do something, we went ashore, hit somebody hard, and came off, as we did in Operation Ernest Will and Praying Manus at the end of the Iraq Iran War. We changed that after the first Gulf War. I fought H.W. Bush for a very stupid decision. His Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, talked him into it. In the leaving U.S. ground forces in the region and the military just salivated and began to build. And now it is the largest deployment. Don't let anybody fool you on this. It's the largest deployment of U.S. forces in the world. And so coming home with 2,000 people out of Syria is utterly meaningless. And as for the Kurds, the Kurds have shown how to do this. They're not going to get a state. They're never going to get a state. Not in my lifetime. Not in my grandchildren's lifetime. They've shown how to do this in Iraq. You make a deal with Baghdad, you make a deal with Ankara, and you get yourself protected because your shrewdness of that deal allows you then to become one of the most prosperous entities in that state, Iraq. Suleimania now is where Baghdadis go to vacation. You do the same thing in Syria, and Assad has already reached out to the Kurdish leadership in Syria and said, okay, you want autonomy? Hmm, okay, good. Why don't you come serve in my armed forces? Now, Turkey doesn't like that at all, but that is an opening for Assad and the Kurds there. Iran would have no problem dealing with its Kurds in a similar way, so that's the answer to that. Now, Afghanistan, different matter altogether. If I were in my military uniform and I were playing strategist right now, I would say, come home from Germany, come home from Korea, Come home from the Middle East, but don't come home from Afghanistan. Why? Because it was so hard to get there in the first place. Because it is the only country on the face of the earth that any military strategist will tell you is so hard to get to. 
so incredibly. Donald Rumsfeld almost split a gut because the CIA beat him to Afghanistan. They were already there, and they fought the war, really. Here's why you stay. You were cheek and gal, cheek and jowl with your hard power, the most unstable nuclear stockpile in the world, in Pakistan. If you have to leap on that stockpile, for whatever reason, you need to be positioned to do so. The second reason is because you were positioned with hard power. I hope you never have to use it, but should you have to use it to influence the Chinese Belt Road Initiative through Central Asia, you are able to do it. You're in position to do that. We're seeing that Belt Road Initiative, which was at first so productive, positively productive in Kashmir, 30 kilometer corridor that was just bustling with trade and improvement in people's lives, uh, totally obviated apparently by this attack by the terrorist group in Kashmir that killed 40 and wounded something like 97 Indians. Then the third reason I'd stay in Afghanistan, and this is going to sound really nefarious, but remember I'm in my military hat now, <laughs> is so that I could cover, if necessary, from Afghanistan, CIA operations in Xinjiang province aimed at using the 20 million Uyghurs who live there and hate the Han Chinese, aimed at getting them to oppose the Han Chinese should we ever be in a hot conflict with China. Afghanistan is the one place from which you can do that. Indians would never let you do it. So, now there's, I, I'd stay in Afghanistan for as long as we've been in Germany or Korea, with a minimal force at least. Do you expect a hot war with China? No, but that would be part of the reason we wouldn't have one. <laughs> you know, we're trying to make India the biggest part of that reason. If you look from China's perspective, you understand why their Dash 9 line and their extravagant claims in the South China Sea are being made, because we have them hemmed in. We have them hemmed in. Look at Japan, Korea, Burma now, Myanmar, with whom we've made a new deal. And India, uh, arguably China's most powerful protagonist, if you will, that's contiguous with them. Um, the Indian Navy right now thinks its whole world revolves around interoperability with the United States Navy. Delhi hates that. They don't like to be public about it, but we have China hemmed in. Very, very hemmed in. Their fleet can't even get out of the South China Sea before we sink a third of it. That's why they want that extra space to, to operate in. So, I, no, I don't want a war with China, and I don't think we have to have one. Thank you. You, you need to hedge your bets. Let me ask one final question before we really open it up. <laughs> Uh, Iran. Iran is like a hobby horse for President Trump and his administration. They, you know, seem to be obsessed with Iran. They, of course, withdrew from the Iran nuclear treaty. The Europeans and other countries, uh, China, for example, and Russia, stayed in, and that has brought conflict with the United States as well. What do we do about Iran? What would be a sensible policy to deal with Iran? You want to go first? <laughs> well, I, you know, we had a sensible deal with I Iran, and uh, the United States withdrew from it, and the Europeans and, and the other uh, signatories have stayed with it. So uh, uh, let's just uh, stay with it and, and outlast our own ad administration. I think the best thing to do is to leave that in place and to ignore Iran while combating it in its uh, efforts to stir a revolution and conflict uh, in its neighborhood and to continue to uh, uh, spike its nuclear program and its ballistic missile program uh, with uh, cyber kinds of things and make it clear to them that as long as they are going to be the international terror, the, the greatest uh, uh, terrorist uh, uh, promoting state, uh, we are going to oppose it. And eventually, I think, I don't know how long, uh, they are going to have to deal with their own internal problems. And we're actually we're uh, worsening them for them e economically and politically. Colonel uh, Wilkerson, it's an it's an intriguing academic problem right now, as well as a real problem. Uh, I agree. We actually, we being the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, passed the secret talks off to the Obama administration. We'd already started the openings in Oman, and Bill Burns going to Oman. And Obama picked up on it, tightened the international sanctions, which was absolutely necessary, and got the diplomacy, which was just described, and a good deal. 
and now we have violated it. And we didn't withdraw, that's technically we withdrew, but we violated it because it was a UN Security Council resolution uh, organization of which we we're a permanent member. And they made the resolution uh, with, the, with the agreement, so we violated it. John Bolton and Donald Trump, I suspect, don't give a damn about the United Nations. So. Here's what I see happening that worries me, and you, you hinted at it. Um, right now, I was at a group at the uh, Institute Gulf, Gulf, Arab Gulf State Institute in Washington the other day with five of the best uh, Iranian experts we feel, uh, two Iranian Americans, Bakhtiari from the University of Utah, and I, I forget the woman's name, but she's really sharp. And they all said what's happened because of the U.S. errors in the region, mainly the removal of Saddam Hussein, and the attempt to remove and failure to remove Bashar al-Assad, have strengthened one institution in Iran to the point where they are now the kingmakers. And no matter what happens in the coming Ayatollah transition or the coming elections, which are right around the corner, uh, the IRGC, the Iran Revolutionary Guard, is the real power. In Iran now. One even predicted a military dictatorship hiding behind whoever is the new Ayatollah. Contradicting, not contradicting, but standing in opposition to that is what was just pointed out. We're getting some really good polling from Iran right now that shows that the first time since 1979 in the revolution, the lower classes are getting angry. The Ayatollah and the Ahmadinejads and others could always count on the lower classes because they're the ones most impacted by the theocracy, by the Islamism, if you will. And they're getting unhappy. So we asked the question of the pollsters, you know, can you tell us why? We thought it would probably be sanctions. It wasn't. They're angry at the corruption, the malfeasance, the incompetence in their own government. And so this is a phenomenon that just might bring a new revolution. But here's the problem. Do we think, as the United States of America, seeking hegemony from one end of the earth to the other, do we think that any government in Tehran, regardless of its constitution, that could be a Jeffersonian democracy, <laughs> is really going to have a different foreign and security policy, given the kingdom of Saudi Arabia trying to take it down every five seconds? And is Saudi Arabia going to be happier if it becomes a Jeffersonian democracy? Hell no! So the power dynamics aren't going to change a bit that might even get more intense. We need a rapprochement with Iran. And it needs to cover all manner of things. Ballistic missile testing, terrorism, corruption, oil and gas, pipelines where they go, releasing pressure on Europe caused by the Soviet or by the Russians. Uh, but with Iranian gas and oil. I mean, it's all kind of getting the Chinese to simmer down a little bit. They're developing Chabahar and Bandar Abbas now just incredibly. They, they've got a railroad that comes into Iran from China, and it brings things to Iran. Uh, you know, we need to balance that. You better have a new government in Israel. To get oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bait and law about which no one dare speak. <laughs> Well, we can raise that also when we uh, ask for questions from the audience. Yes, please, there. This gentleman here. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say... Uh, can you wait for the microphone, please? First of all, first of all let me say... He you told me all the students would leave. <laughs> <laughs> They're not supposed to leave, actually. Yeah. It seems to me that since World War II, the United States has had a big foot globally and, and has been the peacekeeper globally. Uh, the strategy today is to uh, make America great again. It seems to be withdrawing uh, from the, this global position and at the same time upsetting our allies. And is that creating a void in which uh, Putin and particularly China uh, can step into? My second question, if I may. Can I, can we just keep it at one question? Maybe we'll call on you again, yeah? Can you? Well, you know, I don't see any reason why there couldn't be a, a new strategic approach to the world that included the hard power element. 
Uh, I certainly would beef up the other elements of national power and focus on them before I ever turn to the hard power, cultural, cultural power, technological power, financial power, economic power, political power, diplomatic power, and so forth. They are atrophying in the tool bag. That said, I, I think you need to talk with your allies and you need to have a, a, a come to Jesus meeting with them almost, if I may say that. Um, and you need to talk about things like power projection. For example, a pair of B-2s from Blackman Air Force Base in Missouri can project as much power from the homeland and on a more timely basis than an aircraft carrier that happens to be, say, coming around the Strait of Florida and has to leg it to the Gulf or to the Eastern Mediterranean. Things have changed. They've changed majorly. Not, not just in terms of what the professor was saying earlier, that we need a whole new look. But you need to talk to your allies and tell them that, hey, it's no longer necessary to have a gray bottom swinging at a, bo at a mooring buoy off Perth to have the Australians convinced that you're for them, that, that your security is a, a concern of yours. That's the first thing, a new, new look at how one projects power and does hard power if, it has, if, if you have to. The second thing I would say is I don't think Putin is looking for more bases and more countries to conquer. I don't at all. I think he's done what he's done in response to what we've done. Uh, Putin was already in Syria. It's the only toehold he has in the Middle East, really. Um, I mean, look at our toeholds. So one of the Iranians once said to me in negotiations in New York around the UN General Assembly, he said, you know, we're a country surrounded by you. We are utterly surrounded by you. Um, Guess what, I said, we need an incidence at sea agreement in the Persian Gulf. We need not to have an incident. He said, wait a minute, we have 1,800 kilometers on the Gulf and you have not one kilometer. Who's the problem here? And he's got a point. Uh, so we cause a lot of this ourselves, uh, the tension, the strife, the potential for conflict and so forth. Our freedom of navigation uh, in the Ch South China Sea right now, we're bringing the Brits in, we're bringing others in to do it. That's fine. Except... You've got to deal with a fundamental problem in order to keep that from eventually blowing up. And I'm really worried about Taiwan right now. Taiwan is looking really bad. Um, that requires diplomacy. It requires other elements of national power than the military. So I would take a whole different approach to the world in order to reassure our, and still reassure our allies and our friends and still keep the ties that bind warm and still keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, we need to stop Cold War thinking. Uh, we, our allies, you know, the concept of alliance is a military term. Uh, NATO really began as a military alliance. We need to keep it uh, in, in order uh, to, to make sure uh, that the Europeans don't begin fighting each other. They're so integrated in NATO that it would almost be impossible. Uh, but also in case Mr. Mr. Putin loses it and thinks he can get a freebie. Uh, I think uh, I would take my stand with Churchill that the only kind of war, uh, uh, something to the effect that uh, the, worst kind, uh, uh, the worst kind of war is a war with allies, but you uh, can't even have one or a relationship, uh, it would be even worse. And so an alliance as strong as NATO, we just have to wait out the current administration in the United States. Uh, we will have to repair alliances around the world, actually. We don't really need to call them alliances anymore. We don't need to militarize our diplomacy no. by using that uh, term. Thank you. Thank Trade you. agreements. Will that be 2021 or 2025? Uh, <laughs> I think it will be before 2021. Right, OK. I need more questions here. Um, let me, uh, there over there, the gentleman there. Excellent program. You've enumerated a lot of problems and have done it very well, but I'd like to ask the professor to suggest a solution, uh, retraining the military. I'm going to make you president for 10 days. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be your policy and what would you implement to give us a better uh, military? I'd be more than 10 days, I'm afraid. <clears throat> I think we have to rethink the entire military officer uh, uh, personnel system so that we develop and promote people not just on the basis of tactical and operational excellence, 
and on the basis of, of broad thinking. Uh, we need to get rid of the uh, up or out. And we, need to, <laughs> we need to educate officers. Uh, I would take every officer, you know, I, I've written this up uh, 10 years ago. Uh, one, one good example, for example, every officer at the captain level who is promoted below the zone must go to graduate school in residence in a war fighting related uh, discipline. Uh, and there are many other things uh, like that. You can't change huge structures uh, like this uh, in 10 days, if we're lucky, 10 years. But it would require uh, not exactly a consensus, but a powerful uh, chairman of the Senate and, and House Armed Services Committee uh, and a presidential administration that understood the problem and, and was willing to spend the political Thank you very much. And let me just let me just yeah. add, right now what you have on the Armed Services Committee is cheerleaders. Right. Not only cheerleaders, but you have people who tell the Defense Department when they ask for $716 billion as an annual appropriation, no, we're going to give you $750. Right. And you're going to buy these planes from Georgia and these planes from New Mexico. And you're going to have a nuclear modernization program that keeps these labs open and so forth. We know you don't need the nuclear weapons. We know that you could get rid of one leg of your triad because Absolutely. it's so vulnerable. The missiles in the ground, they fight a first strike. You get rid of them. You've got submarines, you got bombers. That's all you need. Submarines are still virtually invulnerable. I told the Air Force Chief of Staff when I was the Chief of Air Force history that he should get rid of the land base uh, 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 part of the triad. And he said, but it's so cost effective. I said, yes, but it's just <laughs> targets. And whatever number of millions of dollars are that you spend on it is just wasted. He looked at me like I was nuts. Yeah. Yeah. The gentleman here. Uh, I was interested in your early remarks. You mentioned critical thinking, and that's us as the, the citizenry as well as the government. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you envision um, really multi-way efforts. How, how would you airplane this room to really study the problem? I wouldn't waste too much time on social media uh, and, and because it you know, dangles the shiny things in front of your eyes. Uh, spend 15 to 30 minutes a day reading about military affairs and good websites or in good uh, publications. Talk about it with your friends. Uh, raise it uh, with, with your political leadership to the extent that you're in contact with your political leadership uh, and get them to think about it. When I moved here, one of the first persons I met was David Price, who's just an outstanding legislator. And I looked at him and I said, you know, you really need to support strategic missile defense. And he looked at me. Why in the world, he said, would I do that? I said, so that you don't have to explain to your grandchildren or, or your children's grandchildren uh, why you didn't take steps to protect American cities uh, at some point decades in the future. I mean, just raise, raise questions with them. Be critical thinker, be a critical thinker yourself. I heard it this morning. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me, let me add something to that. Um, in the conversation I had with uh, Dr. McLean at the Carolina Inn today, she gave me an appreciation for how this network has spread all over the world. 66 countries now. Um, they don't disdain social media. They are on social media big time, and they're influencing the millennials and post-millennials. They are well-funded, and their message is tailored to the particular millennial section they happen to be addressing in the Czech Republic or in Poland or wherever they happen to be. Um, one of their allies in this regard is Steve Bannon, who goes from government to government trying to sell his wares. The other thing she alerted me to was how much they have done in this country with state legislatures. This is really frightening. They have, right now, 28 
moving towards the 34 required to do something we have not done in our history, and that is have a state call constitutional convention. And they are ready. They know what they're bringing to that convention, and they know how ignorant most Americans are of anything like this. They're going to flow into that ignorance, and they're going to create the kind of government they want and the kind of constitution they want if they get this. And I'll bet you there are two people in this room that know that's even happening. You probably don't even know, or maybe you do know this because it's been so advertised here of late, thank God, that the Republicans through various and sundry, my party through various and sundry tricky methods and so forth, have got more state legislatures now and they have got them in ways that are chokeholds on them. And Wisconsin and North Carolina are two uh, stellar examples. So that uh, they don't even, these people don't even know they're operating in accordance with this agenda that these Koch brothers and others that they've hired from all over the world have. But it's happening. And it, it's happening underneath the recognition and capability, I guess you would say, of most Americans. It's very dangerous what they're doing. It's very strategic, it's very well funded, and it's got an intellectual content that reminds me more than anything else of Lenin and the revolution that, you know, the 10 days that shook the world. And the Democratic Party seems oblivious to it. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get some more questions. They are the, right at the back, the, the gentleman there in the blue shirt. Thank you for your discussion of a lot of things going on right now, but what I'm concerned about is while we are concerned with what the National Security State is doing, or the economic people are doing, the thing that's looming over all of us is the climate of the earth and the fact that you know, we're going to have to place up a place to live, we can't live here anymore, which is not serious. You know, I belong to a group called the Climate and Security Working Group in Washington, which, as you might imagine, is uh, composed mostly of DOD and DHS, Homeland Security. Um, and I have to, I, I'm very embarrassed to tell American audiences that the lead agency in Washington on climate change is the Defense Department. You can think about that for a moment, it has its own embedded dangers. <laughs> but they are, and it's because they have to do risk management. And they understand that when the risk gets to 60, 65 percent, you buy insurance. And so they are working hard. We're doing all manner of things. Uh, Norfolk, for example, the shipyards are going underwater. I said that in a theater in Richmond recently, and a lady stood up in the back and said, Dale, don't tell me about the shipyards. My backyard's underwater. <laughs> and she's right. Uh, we just had to move at a cost of a picayunish cost, $20 million. We had to move cables up on the wharfs for the carriers because no one ever envisioned those cables being underwater. Well, they're underwater now. They weren't waterproof. So we had to move the cables. These are for email exchanges and communication between the carriers when they're in maintenance. Um, it's, we, we're in New Orleans. We're in Charleston. We're in Mayport. We're uh, in San Diego. Different alliances are forming in each of those places. but. Uh, the DOD is seized of this because they understand the conflict that's going to be produced by the facilities on the coast, which is about 60% of their facilities, uh, are going to be underwater. We just built a $300 million facility on Kwajalein and had to abandon it after two years. We built a $400 million facility in Alaska and had to abandon, abandon it after five because the melting permafrost undermined the foundation. This is crazy. You know, you're right. It is an existential challenge, and we're paying too little attention to it. Thank you. Yes, please, yeah. Thank you. I would uh, like to address the elephant in the room. I think we're uh, bypassing the mainstream media and who owns it and the impact. Uh, not too long ago, we had 50, some 50 major owners go down to six, and one of them is the wealthiest man in the world, Jeff Bezos. And we need to remember that the main cheerleaders for the Iraq invasion included the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the New Yorker. And we need to look at the fact that Seymour Hersh, our leading, our, leg, our legendary Investigative journalists are no longer being published in this country. He was blocked. 
And also Stephen Cohen, who is one of our leading Russian scholars from Princeton and NYU, is also blocked in this country. Do you have a question? We have excellent. I'm asking our gentlemen to discuss this. OK, thank you. I am asking you to consider that we have some of our best investigative journalists are now online. And that's not social media. That is solid, solid investigative journalism because they can't get published in the mainstream media. Thank you very much. I, I take your point uh, and was looking at an analysis of the media not too long ago that was being bandied around the FCC and everybody was laughing about it and I was looking at it with great alarm because we get, we're getting ready to get worse. We're getting ready to kill more local newspapers, more outlets that basically report the news as they see it on a daily basis or weekly basis. And it's, it, it's a travesty what we've done. Um, the other thing that troubled me about this report is, as you indicated, how this, is, this group that I'm talking about that goes by Americans for Prosperity in Montana, it goes by other names in other, and it goes by other names in Poland and so forth, that is funded by the Koch brothers and other billionaires associated with it. Sheldon Adelson gives money to it, for example. Um, it is very much interested in this phenomenon and feeding it and trying to kill newspapers and kill independent sources and so forth. Here's what I see countering it right now. And my kids have taught me this at William Mary and George Washington and elsewhere. They're not paying any attention. When you see that CNN has 4% share now, that Microsoft has 2% share now, that all the cables together, including Fox, don't have more than 22%. You gotta ask yourself, well, is everybody so ignorant not going anywhere else? Where are they going? Well, my kids are going to where you said. And they're very discerning about where they go. They might, if they speak French, they might go to Le Monde and Associated Newspapers in France, or they might go to El Pais or something, or the London Financial Times or whatever. Or they go to some of these people you're talking about who are online. That's where they're getting their news now. They don't pay any attention to the New York Times, the Washington Post. And this is scaring the bejesus out of those papers because they realize they've got no future. Not unless they can attract these people. Same fear the military has. The latest polling by the Army shows that millennials and post-millennials have the propensity to be recruited of zero. The most powerful phenomenon operating here now is military families. That was the most likely to be recruited guy or gal from a military family, uncle, grandfather, father, you know, whatever. Now they're advising their youngsters not to go into the and it's scaring all the services, particularly the Army, because they're the hardest to recruit for. These millennials are bringing a new attitude towards this country, and towards Washington, and towards government. And it's, it's astonishing how fast it's changed. It's changed for me in 15 years at a university. Different kids. I, I would say that there's no solution to this within the capitalist system or other than to remove uh, the uh, powerful um, influence of money directly in elections. And I don't know what, how fast that can be done. My guess is it would take 10 or 20 years. But the greatest um, undermining, it seems to me, uh, of the political system has been the Citizens United uh, Supreme Court. I think that the problem rests with people in the universities and in uh, the educational system is that they're not connecting with the young people and getting them engaged such that they will seek the outlets that they can find. They can go, as Colonel Wilkinson says, uh, uh, onto foreign websites, all sort of websites, uh, to get information, but they need to be taught critical thinking and they need to be taught a skepticism uh, to seek out the kinds of topics that they are interested in uh, and to think about them and to triage them and to, to, to uh, not to triage them, but to... Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. In, in, interestingly, that, that I'm told that Bouffe Clicquot, Dom Perignon, Krug, all was broken out by the Coke group.
group when Citizens United passed. <laughs> I, by the way, I can recommend the BBC website, by the way, even in English. Uh, let me ask some more people here, the gentleman here. We have a few minutes left and then we need to go home. Colonel, on the side first, I heard Stanley Crystal speak, speak recently, and he said only about 30% of the age appropriate population in the U.S. can even pass the physical to get into the army. Uh, one third are too obese, and one third are mentally incapable of passing the ASPAP. Okay. <laughs> and then there are people with uh, moral problems. <laughs> But we're taking them with waivers now. Not all of them. <laughs> Not all of them. Not all of them. But my, my, my question is, and I, I hesitate to cite the source, is the New York Times, which reported recently that somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the people in, in France and Germany um, find Russia more trustworthy than the U.S. This is a very disturbing development. I saw two polls uh, two days ago. One was on Korea, 66% of the Koreans poll, 5,000 person poll, plus or minus 3%, I think it was, uh, thought the United States was the number one threat to their future. Japan, it was 66%. Pakistan, as you might imagine, you'd think it would be India. No, it was the United States, it was over 80%. In Egypt, it was over 80%. There are about somewhere between 2.5 and 3 billion people in the world who, when polled, will say the number one threat to their future is America. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Who would be... Okay, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Colonel Wilkinson, thank you very much. You've spoken about so many of the problems we're facing, and you're working very hard to describe them and work to solve them. When you were at the center of power, and you were chief of staff to Colin Powell and working within the administration, can you tell us all the triumphs and successes you've had? Wow. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you two. The biggest failure was the presentation at the United Nations on 5 February 2003. Successes? And the, and the greatest success was April 10th and the days following 2001 when a U.S. Navy reconnaissance plane, EP-3, ran into a Chinese F-8 fighter. The fighter crashed and the pilot died. The EP-3, with 24 souls on board and all manner of NSA-like equipment, had to go down on Hunan Island in an emergency landing. Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld wanted that to be the precursor for the new Cold War. They were looking for that big time. Colin Powell picked up his cell phone and called Chen Chi in, the most knowledgeable Chinese at that time of North America, got him on his cell phone. They were traveling. The presidential party from China was traveling in South America and said, Chen, we need to work this out. Three days later, it was worked out. They apologized in Chinese. We apologized in English, you know, went back and forth. And they said, come get your plane. We had sent Joe Pruer, Admiral Joe Pruer, former ambassador to China and a four-star admiral, to do our negotiating. Rumsfeld sent a lieutenant. The Chinese chopped the plane back and sent it to DOD, COD. Now, we handled the China account from that moment on, which I think is the most important strategic account for the United States. And people have asked me, well, why could Powell do that and not have the president intervene? The president understood the importance of Walmart and other economic factors, but that's the best I can say. You know, he understood how important China was to the American consumer. And so he wasn't about to let Cheney and Rumsfeld interfere and get the war they wanted. He wanted to maintain an even keel. And people don't know that. The metaphor Powell used to use with me was, you know what I do, Larry? I said, yeah, I know what you do. You do damage control. It's, it's, it's a very important function, but it's not very glamorous. He said, yeah, I clean the dog shit off the Oval Office cloth carpet. And that was, it, was, it was a great metaphor for what he did, but he did do some positive things. I mean, he kept Germany and the United States close with Joska Fischer as the foreign minister. When Bush was calling Schroeder a effing idiot in the Oval Office and hated Germany, 
with some reason, Schroeder promised him in the Oval that he wouldn't use the Iraq War and his opposition there too in his uh, coming election campaign. Went back to Germany and did just that. So Bush had to read. He, he reneged on his promise to Bush. Um, but it, there were some successes. But it was a difficult time. I always say this. Colin Powell, with all his faults, and he has them, uh, with all his imperfections, he deserved a better president. <laughs> I think we would like to welcome him here. Why don't you pop over the message we would like to see? Got 100,000 bucks. Thank you. Let, let, let me thank Professor Cohn, Colonel Wilkerson for coming here. Let me thank you for staying until the very bitter end and for asking so many questions. That was a great evening. Thanks very much. And may I remind you, in the, on the 5th of March, we have an event on Brexit with the guy who runs the Northern Ireland office in Washington, Sir Norman Houston, who will enlighten us how the Irish will suffer from Brexit and how Brexit is going to play out. Thank you very much for coming to us.